Just as a quick recap of where we are. So we're in Ephesians, um, Paul, letter to the church of Ephesus. Ephesus um, being a major city of commerce and of trade. Um, the main god there, I can't remember her name because it's crazy, but she's a god of fertility. Diana, Diana correct. Uh, thank you. Um, so Diana, and they have a huge temple there. And not only is she kind of the main Greek god there, but she's also their source of income. So a lot of people there are silversmiths and blacksmiths, and so they make idols for a living. Um, and so when Paul comes in preaching, you can't follow this idol anymore. Uh, it throws not only the religious structures or the religious on edge, it throws the social and economical status of many people and wait, hold on, we make money off of this God. How are we supposed to um, supposed to, you know, live now if you're telling us we can't make gods for other people or if we can't make them for ourselves? So um, we're going to be starting Ephesians 5 and chapter 22. And uh, when God sent Ephesians into my heart to do, I had no, th I had not even thought of this as a passage. And this um, when, I, when I read this last week and I was like, oh man, this is what I'm going to be going through, uh, I got real nervous <laughs> because though I am married and I just had my second year anniversary yesterday, wow. um, thank you, thank you, yeah, um, she's putting up with me for another year, it's great, yeah, she said, I'll, I'll keep you, you're great. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see, yeah. We have a baby on the way. Obviously, lots of new things in our horizon. October 3rd. Really? Awesome. Well, if he comes right on time, then he'll be the same. Yeah. So, um, yeah, October 3rd. Yeah, we're, we're about two months out. So, first child. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, but this passage is highly confronting in our today's society. And I hope that as we go through this section of scripture, um, we can unpack how it's really not. It's not this groundbreaking social issue of, of who's more important, who's a second class citizen, who's any of this. I hope, that, um, I hope to, that God reveals to each and every one of us through this passage that just like in everything, God has an order. God has a way that he wants things done, not because it's just this dictatorship, but because he knows what's best and because he created us to be able to do these things. So let's start right in verse uh, 22, which is where we left off. Wives, mm, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body, but the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands and everything. Oh, how, how could he? What? God, you've got this wrong. You clearly didn't write the Bible for 21st century. Welcome. Uh, sorry, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 verse 22 um, is where we just read through, 22 to 24. Like how, how could God do this? Doesn't he know? Like, doesn't he get it? Yeah. I think as we just talked about, yes, he does get it. It depends on what your context of subject. So what being subject is, we need to define those terms. This doesn't mean that somehow you are just some second class citizen to be owned by a man. Um, it's also important to note that it's not women are subject to men. That's a generalization that people in our popular culture have taken. Oh, it says, wives submit to your own husbands, so therefore women are inferior to men. No, 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 no. God says nothing about that. This has no application outside of the confines of a man and his wife. So that's important. To be subject or to be in submission, it doesn't mean inferiority. Let's break down the word submission. It means to be under the mission. Submission. It doesn't mean that you're to be dictated to and just thrown around and, and used. No, no, no. We're all under the same mission. And if, um, if you look at marriage as our mission, as a marital mission to follow God and obey God for his glory, I think we can all get behind that we're all in submission to that first. 
and that it's not the job it's not the job of the wife um Oh, I'm sorry, it's not the job of the man in, exclusi in exclusivity to follow that mission, but it's also the job of the wife to follow in that mission. Um, and so the issue that we often put is ourselves above that mission. Oh, but this is what's good for me. I think that that's a lot of the debate today. We'll get to the husband part later. Don't, don't worry. Well, there will be plenty of stuff that will, will come down on the husbands too. But if we're just talking about on the wives' side of things, Oftentimes in today's culture, it's, oh, well, that doesn't benefit me. I don't get to do the thing that I want to do. I don't get to do this job, that thing, be a part of this, be a part of that in a way that benefits me. But what does God say here in his word? He says, um, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. We'll get more into that when we talk about husbands, because God's got triple the amount of verses for husbands to take note of in this passage. But what, what are you to be following? You're to be following your husband as Christ, as he is following Christ. I love that passage that Paul talks about, follow me as I follow Christ. It's not because Paul was this, you know, reincarnation of Jesus. It's he's saying, look, listen, I'm getting my energy from the source. I'm getting my lifestyle from the source. Follow me in that. So that we're, you're not really looking at me as a door. You're looking at me as a window. You're looking at me and seeing Christ through me. In the same way, wives submitting to husbands should be that way. Not because the husband has some special revelation, but because God ordained that there's some order in the way that we are going to do this. <laughs> it's not just going to be a free-for-all. I think of how many times uh, in TV shows they portray, okay, we have to make a decision. And there's four of them, and two of them say this, and two of them say that. And then they're like, and what happens normally in the show? They fight, and they normally break, and their relationship's severed, and people get mad. We also have to think about that this is in the confines of a marriage, or at least it should be in the confines of a marriage where both parties are following Jesus. So... What, what makes it easy for a wife to submit to a husband when her husband's following Jesus? <laughs> Which may, it, and, and in the flip, it is very difficult. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like elsewise. But it's not a cultural norm. It's something that people today are not grasping. But I don't think that it's this second class like we talked about. It's not about being subservient and a servant and just doing my biddings. It's, hey, we're in the same boat. We're doing this together. We're under the same mission. My job is just different from yours. And a husband that understands that, a husband who is following Christ, knows that it's not just about you go do the dishes and I'll go take out the trash. Though those might be things that you do, those aren't definitions of how you live or what your job is. The Lord isn't in the... Um, it's not... Submission is not the... Um, confines, it should be our motives. The Lord should be our motives for submission. So Paul isn't saying um, that you should just submit to your husbands just because. What he's saying is, is that um, you should submit to your husband because I asked you to. And that um, he is the only one, Christ, God, should be the only one that with 100% submission that we follow. So obviously there are those cases outside. We're not talking about abusive spouses. We're not talking about a spouse who asks you to deny your faith. We're not talking about these. Obviously, there are those outliers. We're talking about a marriage where you have walked into your husband and, and into this marriage relationship and you have said that we are following Christ, which, yeah, absolutely, which leads to another thing. And I know that this is probably not the crowd to really be considering this, but I am recording this and, and other people will see this. That's why it's so important to spend time with and make sure that the person that you're marrying is that, is that way, is in submission to Christ first for ladies. Not by how they look, not how attractive they are, not, oh, they can pick up, you know, they could mow the lawn every day. That would be so great or every week or whatever. That's why it's so important because God is asking you, once you get into this relationship, your job is full-blown submission to who they are. And if you choose somebody who's not following me, you're making a huge mistake. 
And today, our culture is so caught up in, oh, I, I, I want to marry the most attractive person. Uh, Lydia and I were watching a show um, that you, last night about uh, the, the, the Asian culture and, and stuff. And um, in the episode, the, the main character's brother ends up marrying this supermodel. And they end up in this big house and all this kind of stuff because she has all this money. And the brother's like, how, 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 you know, like you got, how did you get better than me? How did you get all this? And it's like, yeah, that's, you know, that might look great. But the question is, is what, what is the value in their marriage? Is it in beauty, which goes away with age? Is it in money, which can easily be spent? Is it in all these other things? Or is it in everlasting life? Is it in a God who wants to guide us to the best, not just to what we want? So we need to have that motive. It can't be through attraction. It can't be through height. That's something uh, my mom always said was, she was like, you, Taylor, marry a tall woman. Marry a tall woman. I'm like, boy, that confines real quick. And Chop's like, you know, I'm 6'4". That, that puts a lot of... <laughs> That puts a lot of people down. And anybody who's met my wife, she's not, <laughs> she's not really tall. <laughs> you can't pick based off of those things, based off of physical attributes. You need to be picking based off of the fruit of their faith. And I say that because a lot of guys will talk it up. I did for plenty of time in high school years. Oh yeah, I'm this, I'm this holy guy. Yeah, oh, I do all this good stuff. I'm such a nice guy. I do, you know, all this and then that wasn't really true on the back end. I was manipulative, things like that, and things that weren't brought to my attention until far later in my high school years that, oh my goodness, like, I'm not actually following Christ in my relationships. I'm following what benefits me. James, what's up? I feel like most of the guys who do that, I mean, they're not even looking for women. They feel like they're just looking for hookups, Yeah, and what, what, is, what is popular today? That exact thing. Exactly. And as to clarify, I believe, I mean, they shouldn't be just looking for women because of their physical form. I believe they should be looking who has the most heart needs to, you know, mm. what's more about them, about their personality, what's mm. more about them, about loyalty, what's more about being compassionate yeah. and more trustworthy. And I think we can lump all of those things into a man of God. Am I right? A man of God is a loyal man. A man of God is somebody who has a heart for the hurt, the loss, the broken, not that in, in saying that in like women being that way, but people in general. And that's why I say the fruits is because a man whose um, authority is of Christ, we talk about it in James, right? The fruits. It comes from the fruits. Of show, I, I'll show you my faith by, through my works, by my works. But husbands are not off the hook by any stretch of the imagination. Let's keep going. Um, starting in verse 25, husbands, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the word, uh, washing of the water with the word, that he might also present himself to the church in her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but she would be holy and blameless. So husbands all ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does also for the church, because we are members of the holy body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife as himself and the wife must see it that she is respect see it that she respects her husband um in my bible that's quadruple the amount of lines that the women get in instruction here and i think it's on purpose <laughs> but it, it's it's very very cool when you see these two things wrap when you see the way that 22 through 25 and then 25 to the end intermingle it's such a beautiful thing to see the way that the codependence upon of a husband and a wife and then their dependence on christ works um i think if there was a word to define this it's servant leader for husbands 
What does he talk about most in this passage? He references it twice. You should love them as yourself. Oh, I, I, I you know, pretty selfish guy because I'm human. Right? We can all agree with that. So uh, I should love her with the same intent that I love myself. Oh man, uh, I keep I, when we were in marital counseling, Lydia and I. Um, one of the funny things that Pastor Dwayne, because we did it with Pastor Dwayne, would always say is, "You're not going to realize how selfish you are until you get married." And then you're, and then you're going to realize it. And then you're going to have a kid and you're not going to realize how selfish you are. And then you're going to have another kid and you're going to realize how selfish you are because those things push boundaries. All of a sudden, it's not about me. I don't just get to go out and go hang out with friends without consulting because it will affect my significant other. Um, things like that. And so with great power comes great responsibility like a superhero, am I right? Um, James 3.1, I, I, I equate it to this because I really like uh, this. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that, with, uh, that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. What's, what's kind of the underlying thing here? Listen, if you want more responsibility, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be given those, more is going to be required. You will be judged with a greater strictness. And I feel that this applies to husbands. If you're going to become a husband, know that you have taken on the role of spiritual leader in your household. And your job is to be a spiritual leader and God will judge you based off of how well you did that spiritual leadership. He will say, you walked into this and your job is to be the spiritual leader of this home. How did you live up to that? God calls us to be husbands like Christ. Christ put the church above his physical and emotional needs. I think of the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He's literally saying, Lord, take this from me. He clearly had objections to what was about to happen. But what, did he, what was the ultimate outcome? I love them, and I'm going to sacrifice myself for them because they need this. And everything that the husband does is a function of this whole thing mm -hmm. is for the purpose of building up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. What does it say in 26 and 27? He sanctified her, cleansed her, washed her, presented her in all glory, no spot, no wrinkle, holy and blameless. Um, I, I pray that all the time for myself is, Lord, like, would you give me opportunities and would you work in my heart and give me wisdom as to when I can show, show Lydia off? When I can show, man, she's growing in Christ. When I can show, like, oh, man, look at how respectable she is as a young woman who's having a child and for what most people would say is early at 22. You know, most people are like, oh, you should wait. You know, get your career started. Get all, no, 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 we're starting now. And guess what? We're going to grow this kid for Christ. And look at how awesome that is. Um, for those who are in the dating scene, this is a huge deal. Are you fornicating? Are you out there? And tarnishing that person's image? Are you taking things that are distinguished only for a, man and a, for a man and a wife, a man and a woman in the confines of marriage? I think of um, how rampant premarital sex is in our, in our um, culture and how much God says, you're, you're tarnishing that image. <laughs> we were talking about it on Sunday in Galatians, I believe, about um, the woman who came in and, and the people and the the gentlemen who are in the room saying, oh, if only you knew who this woman was. I believe that's what we were talking about this Sunday. But, um, and they said, if you only knew what she had done, she's an adulteress, she's a fornicator. That image is ruined because of, I mean, it's a, it's a joint effort. She played a role in it, but the spiritual leader of the men were not there also saying, no, you're not married. You don't need this. And, and so guys, it's our responsibility to, bear that to also say this isn't right i care about your image i care about how god sees you i care about presenting you why do we wear white why do the women wear white when they come up to the altar to get married it's supposed to be a, a symbol of their purity they're blameless they're spotless unfortunately i i, I venture to say that the majority of them are not walking up there <laughs> blameless or spotless forgiven maybe yes but but the Lord wants us as men, as husbands, to protect the image of our wives. Um, it is amazing how many people that we do come into the uh, pregnancy center, uh -huh. and some of them wanting abortions, other ones not. Yeah. It's all of a sudden, if you get one that's married, it's like, 
oh my goodness. You know, when yeah. you try to talk to yeah. them about getting married, it's like, oh, yeah. why should we make that commitment? It's, there's no yeah. Yeah, I, I, I heard of, um, I think it was the Benells. I might be wrong. Don't quote me on this. I did see it from a, a pastor somewhere on my Facebook. Like it was from somebody that I know, not just a post. But what they did was they sponsored a full wedding. It was actually in a Calvary Chapel magazine. They sponsored 12 cohabitating families, cohabitating people to marriage. They said, we'll pay your, we'll pay your um, fees for whatever the... the um, the piece of paper, the marriage certificate, we'll pay that. We're going to throw a wedding for all of you guys here in the church. We're going to throw a ceremony. Everybody's invited and, and did that. Man, that, that's the church mobilizing. You want to talk about, man, how do I get people to get married? Well, help them, <laughs> you know, um, help them get there. And, and a little bit of it is, is that we have to break the cultural idea that you get married because you spend $10,000 on a wedding. The piece of paper, at least in Collin County, is $81. And Lydia and I could have gotten married with $81. We were blessed that our family was like, we want to have a party and we want to celebrate this. And most people want that. But that is not, to, to, to get that certificate, that's not required, um, is to have a giant party. It doesn't seem to be required to get a certificate anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for, for real. We, uh, we had a friend, not really a friend. Lydia was at school with a, with a, a group that... Um, the common law was kind of coming over. They had, they, they had kind of forced their way into it. And the husband, or the, the guy, I shouldn't say husband, didn't really want it. But she just kind of moved in, made things happen, changed name, changed social security, and without him even knowing. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh my gosh, you fall under, you know, you just get the certificate. Like, make it happen. It's not, it's not that difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Your commitment to them. And ladies, if they're not making that commitment, yeah. you're going to have further issues down the road. <laughs> I, I, they always joke about missionary dating, you know, like when I was in high school. Oh, you know, high schoolers, don't missionary date. Like, don't, don't go out there looking for a girl that, at least for me, when they were talking to me, don't go out there looking for a girl so that you can get her saved and then live happily ever after. Like, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in marriage either. <laughs> you don't just find somebody who's unsaved and all of a sudden break them of that. Um, now, there are outliers of that case. I know plenty of marriages, even within this church, who were unsaved, and their marriages are awesome now because Christ did a difference in their life. That is possible. I'm saying that you guys, as people who are sitting here, should not engage in that kind of a relationship just for the sake of, oh, maybe we'll have an awesome story and a testimony of how God worked in our marriage one day. Do it the hard way. Yeah, why? Way, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so I just, I just want to, I just want to push that, that, that Christ cared for the image of the church. He's broken about how dirty the church looks and how politicized and awful Christianity's name has been dragged through the mud. He doesn't like that. He doesn't enjoy it. He wants to see his blameless, loving bride, right? And so it's important. And then she feels cherished and loved. Romans 5, 8, I think demonstrates is the best, but God demonstrated his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. He gave that ultimate. There's no greater love than to lay down your life, right? Um, and, and it's hard. <laughs> it's hard on both sides of the coin. It's very, very difficult to say, I don't want this. Um, one of the things that uh, I love, you guys know, is I love music. And i Blessing and curse, I play a lot of different instruments. And so, oh, buying a drum set sounds awesome. Oh, buying a new guitar sounds awesome. Oh, buying new pedals, buying a new mic, bye, 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 you know? And it can easily become this snowball. And, and you know, I've, I've had to learn over two years. Lydia doesn't buy anything ever, and I just buy all of this cool equipment, <laughs> you know? Man, I, I need to sacrifice our finances for that. I need to be able to put that. We're not, we're not drowning. We have no debt. We're, we're well off. Like, we're, we're very blessed in what God's given us. I'm not trying to say that, like, we're in credit card debt. It's just, is my first thought whenever I'm thinking of going and spending, is it, does this benefit my family? Does it benefit Christ? Or am I thinking, ooh, cool new gizmo, cool new gadget. Ooh, I can't wait. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And we have to sacrifice in those ways. Because... 
God gets the glory when we do those, when we do that. Love is in sacrifice and it's in obedience. Uh, I've been listening to a podcast recently about, um, well, it's about worship. And, and one of the things that he talks about is, is that uh, early Israelites, there are about three or four occasions where they were worshiping, sacrificing and worshiping. And God was like, man, quit it. Like, you guys stink. Like, you guys are just doing this out of, out of, you know, just because you think that it's okay out of just monotony. You guys have no love, no heart of obedience in this. You're just doing this just because, well, the book says it, so I guess I have to. I don't want the heart of it. And God wants our hearts in this. Men, you want to know the best way to lead your wife and family? Never waver in your obedience to God. Never waver in your obedience to God. Sacrifice to see their faith grow. Um, I'm learning this more and more as I do ministry, is that uh, ministers and and leaders in the church get 5% of the glory of what, I mean, they give all the glory to God, but 5% of the appreciation for what they do. I mean, they put out good, good, Christ-centered, loving, put out everything for the people that they love, for the, for the flock, for the, for the body. And they get a lot of times spit in their face <laughs> for what they do. But why do they do it? They don't do it for the love of men. They don't do it because, oh, I, I want people to love me. And I, I guarantee you if they're doing it because they want people to love them, they're not doing it for the right reasons. They're not doing it very well. They do it because, you know, God commands me to lay down everything that I have for these people. And that should be our case. That, that, I think that breaks the boundaries of this Ephesians 5 passage. That should just be period. I sacrifice because I want to see everybody else's faith grow. I don't have to be a minister or a pastor or have an ordination to do that. I can do that now. I can walk outside and do that now. We can do that today within this Tuesday study. We can sacrifice for one another. Um, I think of a song. There's a song by Casting Crowns. It's called The American Dream. I mean, a lot of people will take this This, oh, I need to sacrifice. Okay, I need to work two jobs, work 80 hours a week. I'll never see my family. I'll build them a nice house. They'll have a college fund. They'll have all of this stuff. It's not that either. (laughs) Because there is a nurturing aspect to both sides of this too. Um, I grew up with a father who wasn't saved, who also worked a lot, and he lived that life. I'm going to provide for my family. I'm going to do well. I'm not saying, guys, don't go and make money so that you can shelter your kids. I'm saying... If you're working 80 hours a week and you never spend time to nurture your children, men and women, this applies both ways because women are in the workforce more than ever now. If you're not spending that time in nurturing, your kids are growing up terrible. Like your kids are gonna grow up terrible in that. Lydia works at a, um, at a uh, did work at a daycare where she saw some of those kids almost 12 hours a day. Some of them were there from 6 a.m. when she was there till 5, 6 p.m. <clears throat> Excuse me, when she would leave. It's like, you know, they're like, why do these kids have behavioral problems? Why are there so many troubles? Well, they don't see their parents. You're their parents. <laughs> you spend more time with them than their parents spend with them. And I'm sure when they get home, it's, I'm tired, leave me alone. Sit in front of the TV, be taught by the cell phone. It's not about money. <laughs> it's not about money. It's not about money. I can't say that enough. And my love, uh, something that Chuck Smith says, it's a little bit of a longer quote, but I, I, it gets a really good point across. Um, there's one rule uh, for marriage that God has given to the wife, only one. It's that she, should, um, uh, and that she should keep to this rule. Why would you suppose God made such a rule? Because God understands men. God knows that in man... There is a male macho image that somehow a man needs to feel that he's in control, that he is able, and that he can handle the situation, that, the, that, the, that he is the boss. I mean, that's just part of the male ego. God understands the male ego and the man's needs. So he gave wife one rule to stand by, which is to make her man feel like uh, the, ha- the head of the house and in control, and thus being very compatible and loving. Now, why would God give one commandment to the husbands to love his wife totally and supremely? Because God understands women. God understands their needs. And he understands that the greatest need that a woman has is to feel security and that she is loved supremely by her husband. And there is no, that there is no one else attractive to her eye, attract in her attention, than she is queen. This is their number one 
this should be each of their number ones in life. That's a, that's a great one. That's really, really good. I love it because it does. It's true. It, it plays to both strengths. You want to know how to get to, uh, you want to know what a man really wants. He wants respect. He wants authority. Why, I mean, it's, it's overgrown in our culture today to a misogynistic point. And now we're seeing like a huge kickback. But I know in my personal testimony of our marriage, when Lydia pushes me to make decisions and respects those decisions, there's a circle that happens there is I see her respect my decisions and see it. And I immediately want to give it back in nurturing and loving and doing things for her. And then she feels loved. And so then I want to give it back. So then she says, okay, keep going. You've got this. I, I, I respect your opinion. I know that you care for me. And so then I go, I'm going to care for you even more. <laughs> like, you know, and this thing, and it grows and it grows and it grows. Um, in love towards one another. We do have different jobs as husbands and wives, but they're not to take out the trash, like I was saying earlier. They're not in doing dishes and taking out the trash. They're grounded in adoration and sacrifice for one another, just as Jesus did. When the two work in unison and in love, it's beautiful because who gets the glory? God does. It isn't about us in that situation. It's about God who gets the glory. Yeah. Yeah. But so so let let's talk about that too. Like on that subject, we've become so pitted and rutted in women have to do the dishes and clean the house and and do home decor and men have to do the lawn and have to do weed cutting and building. I think that the, this kind of mentality is added to it. If a woman likes to do home decor, that's great. If a man likes to do home decor, that's also cool. We can't we can't pit people in these jobs. Well, why does your wife do the lawn? Well, she enjoys gardening and doing it. What's, what's wrong with that? It's just a menial job around the house. If I like to do this or I like to do the dishes or I like to do any of that kind of stuff, like right now, Lydia is in eight months pregnant. You women know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very long time of being carrying. She's the heaviest. She's got this giant growing baby in her. He's taking all of her energy and all of her time. What is, is it wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I said you get one job. Do the hottest one outside with the most manual labor. But is, so is it my job to say, no, 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 you, you do the dishes and do the laundry and that's how you, you know, those are just your jobs. No. What do I do? You are in a very difficult time of your life. I'm going to do the dishes. I'm going to do the lawn. And you know, and it's funny because I love her to death. I really do. I love her to death because she comes to me and she's like, I feel like I'm not doing anything around the house. I'm like, you're carrying a child. You're doing far more than I can do. Literally impossible to do what you're doing right now. So let me do the dishes and clean the house and do all this stuff because I'm supporting you in this because you're doing something I physically cannot do. And I need to support you in this. A point on that mm -hmm. is one thing that we've come to realize in our marriage. Mm -hmm. There's a time where she's sick mm -hmm. or depressed or burdened down with things. I end up carrying more of the weight. Yeah. Then there's the flip time. Absolutely. So I'm the one that's sick or down or depressed, yeah. and she carries more of the weight. Mm -hmm. As you're saying, though. My, she is to respect my decision, yeah. my authority, but my authority is to build up and enhance and Absolutely. her. So it becomes a, not a vicious cycle, but certainly a repetitive cycle yeah. back and forth. We're both looking out for the betterment of the other, and so everybody ends up benefiting. And sometimes yeah. the tables don't balance. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, exactly. I think of two situations and I've heard stories. There's multitudes of stories on both sides. I think of the couple that fell in love and the first time he got a cold, she up and left. How could he? He's so lazy. He's got that man problem. But then the flip side of that, I've heard of countless stories of man or woman becomes deathly ill and bedridden for years and they stand right by their side. It's like, wait, how do you get these two contracts? Like, it's just a cold. Like, what's wrong? Well, if your love is grounded in attraction and what you do to me and that, that um, 
you, you want to talk about the four different types of love, storge, phileo, agape. If you're in just that storge, romantic, oh, it's just because you give me eros. butterflies, or eros, I'm sorry, yeah, <laughs> um, eros, love. If you're just in that area and you never are in that agape, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, of course you walk away in that situation because you don't have that deeper sacrificing understanding of love for one another. You Ephesians 6. The idea that it's 50-50. Yeah. And it's a 100 It's 100, 100. Absolutely. I love that. There isn't anything on the other side. They can't yeah. put it out. Well, what is agape? Love that gives with no expectation of a return. And that's what it is when you're sick or you're pregnant or you're, you know, in just this, this area of life working two jobs. There was a time where I was working two jobs and it was like, I'd come home and it'd be two o'clock in the morning. And it's like, I'm sorry, I can't help. Like I'm just gone all day working, you know, and that was the season of life, but it was that balance. It was okay. Well, I, I need you to handle more of this load. And it's like, okay, well, eventually, hopefully this isn't forever, but until then, this is how it is. And then things swung back and things do that. And that's why it's about being obedient to the season that God has you in. But what's the flip side of that is when you know that the other person is walking in the will of God, it's so much easier to step into those things, right? If you know, you know, I know that God led him to two jobs because we need that money. It's so much easier to say, I will sacrifice and do the dishes and do the lawn and do these other things because we're walking in God's will and that's just where we are. It's harder when there's that contention in that uh, he just wants more money and wants to be away from me more. And why would I do more for him? You know, but when you know that they're sacrificing for you in the same way, it just, it's that circle. It goes around and around. So now we go on to the third part of a family unit, unit in the children. Ch chapter six, verse one, children, obey your parents in the Lord for it is right. Honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on this earth. A lot about obedience in these two passages. And why? Because it's all directing back obedience to God. We obey our parental units because God tells us to obey our parental units. Again, they're the outliers. They're the outliers if they are renounce your faith. Uh, you can't do this, go to church, or you don't believe in Jesus, don't tell your friend. Okay, wait, hold on. Hold on, parents. <laughs> um, I was reading through some passages in Proverbs that talk about the, the parent who, who you know, stops, stops their child's faith, literally, ba like, ba bans them to Sheol. Like, it's literally like, if you, if you contain your child's faith, you, you're just sending them straight to the grave. You're not giving them any chance, no opportunity to to believe. And so that, that, I mean, that I'm about to be a parent. That's terrifying. Not that I'm, I don't think I'm going to have any problems with telling my kid to not go to church, but, <laughs> um, third side of our family child, it's a be obedience, but obedience is taught. Isn't it interesting? Kids are naturally born rebellious. You don't have to teach them, Hey, Oh, go, go do the opposite. Yeah. They, you rarely teach them to say no. They just all of a sudden are saying no. And you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? They're just saying no or, or things like that. Obedience is taught, but obedience starts from the parents. If you're, if you as a parent are being obedient to Christ, kids can see that. Kids understand that. If children see their mother submitting in a Christ-like fashion to their father and their father submitting in a Christ-like fashion to Christ. You're teaching them it. You're showing them. You're exemplifying what obedience looks like. And it's important to raise our children to obey God above all else. Um, I'm coming into a season of fatherhood. Um, and I pray that the, the rules and the standards and the things that I set on Jack, because we picked out a name, um, that I set on Jack reflect my submission to Christ first and foremost. Six one. I'm reading the amplified here. Yes. It says obey children obey your parents as again. <laughs> children obey your parents, parents in the Lord, bracketed as his representative. Yeah. We are That's great. representative Absolutely. to the child. Yeah. So we have to be sure that our presentation to the child yeah. is as God represents. Yeah. 
one of the things I was telling Lydia a while back was um, like child, the, creating life and, and, and this birth process and having children is so cool in and of itself just because like you can grow a child inside of you and then like that child grows up and like can do things too. But one of the things that I was thinking about is how much of an honor it is that God would choose us to raise somebody who can do, do God's work for future, for future generations, you know, and get to do that the way that I got to do that or that Lydia got to do that. What an honor that is that I get the opportunity to raise a child in the way of the Lord, you know, and he's going to work through that and he's going to do those things. What a blessing that is. Um, and, but that's also a big undertaking, which means I need to rely on Jesus more and push my relationship and watch him grow me. Yes. Yeah. 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 But but we'll get into more about what that disobe or what that um, what that discipline looks like. Um, verse two is straight out of Deuteronomy five sixteen, um, and we often look at that commandment. Uh, you know, um, honor your mother and father as this like man to man kind of thing, human to human kind of thing. Oh, obey your mothers and fathers because they'll bless you. Uh, but I was reading through some commentaries and first century Jews actually looked at this commandment as a duty to God. Don't, you're not obeying your parents because your parents have something for you. You're obeying your parents because God has something for you. He's going to bless you through your parents. How awesome is that? Because um, God's the one blessing your parents and hopefully in turn, parents blessing you, right? Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger and bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So this is where we get to discipline and instruction, right? But I love this. Do not provoke your children to anger. Um, in this specific one, the, the idea is like purposeful stirring up, like mocking, giving them trouble so that they'll, you know, be angry. Um, and I know a lot of fathers who do this, who, oh, poke fun at them, poke them and, and poke a bear, so to speak, you know, and, and provoke them to anger. And uh, it sounds fun at first. And then you realize really what you're setting them up for. And that's rebellion <laughs> to be like, no, dad, dad just always pokes fun at me. He just he makes, makes bad jokes and things like that. Um, it's terrorizing to me. I've, I've heard it before of, of like fathers who come in and say, I had this happen once and, and the father literally came and was dropping their child off for, for an event that I was at. And the father literally said, go be somebody else's headache for, for two hours. And it just broke me. He broke me. I'm like, what? He's going to internalize that. He's going to hear that and say, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm a headache. I'm a problem. Feel the love. Yeah, right? Where's the love? Where is that? Where's the love in that? And then we wonder, why are you aggressive? Why are you disobedient? Why do we have problems? Well, you, I'm just a self-fulfilling self prophecy. You said I'm a headache. I'm going to be a headache. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 I think there's even like uh, even more to that. Like, so we take that and then also just looking at children as like, d like do bitters. I, I don't know if that's a term, but uh, like the idea that, oh, you just, just do what I say. Oh, go clean your room. Well, that's your duty. Yeah. Good job. Good job cleaning your room instead of, Hey, thank you for listening. Thanks for obeying. I love you. You did a good job. We just think, Oh, y I'm your parent. And so you do what I say. You just go and do what I say. And we never, <laughs> But it's important. It is. It is. It is. You know, being a parent is not the easy. No, I, I fully agree. You know, I, I agree totally with what you said about the headache. That's so totally wrong. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I'm not making excuses for anybody, and parents need to get it together. Yeah. That's where it starts. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But exactly, where does it start? <laughs> It doesn't start because the kid, you know, the kid's naturally rebellious. You can't be surprised when the three-year-old's running around saying no all the time. Like, kids just do that. The question is, is how are you taking that and instructing them in the way of the Lord? How are you taking that and disciplining in a way that shows Christ, Christ through you? Because there is a time and a place for a spanking. I think we can all agree on that. I'm talking to the right generation for that, <laughs> for spankings. And I know some people now that are 65 and they yeah. still 
are being the problem. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but here's the question. Are we coming at them immediately in anger and frustration and immediately just saying, here it is, I'm cracking the whip, I'm making this happen? Because what do they see in that? Oh my gosh, I'm, 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 terror, I'm terrorized. It goes back to the it's fear. Of, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so are we coming in anger and wrath as parents to our children? Because God judged. But what, what do we always talk about? The final wrath, the wrath of God being poured out. He never did that in a, in a loving manner, but he did correct his children. When we talk about um, the Babylonian captivity, things like that, that was God's wrath being poured out. But that's not the good kind of, I'm here to correct you. This is, no, 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 it's over. You blew it. <laughs> the potter makes a pot. Mm -hmm. He doesn't start by beating the clay with the baseball bat. Yeah. He starts by carefully molding the mm -hmm. It takes time, and it's a long, drawn-out process. So yeah. And also think about that, potters. Do potters normally get it first try? They just mold it up, and it's good? No. They end up marring the clay is the term that they use. So they build it up and then they see something come, an imperfection of something. Okay, well, back to ground one. Back to ground one. We're starting over and we'll build up. We build up from there. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the words of a... Pa oh, well, yeah. It's, it, that is also cyclical to me. When the parents get stirred up in anger and frustration and then they turn that anger and frustration onto their child, then the child gets angry and frustrated and turns that back on the parent. And the parent gets more angry and turns it back onto the child. There is a place for disobedience. There is a place to, to as Pastor DeWayne has, you know, said it, to bring the, the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge because we're stubborn human beings, individuals. Sometimes it takes that kind of punishment. Yep. Mm -hmm. Not just obey your parents. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. The words of a parent are like gold to a child, and I think we can all attest to that. There are things that our parents have said to us that we've remembered, good or bad, that we have remembered our whole life. That even if like a teacher or somebody else said to us, we probably wouldn't remember. But there's something about that relationship. It's very intentional, very specific that God made. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the bad things stay with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. I love this. Um, Okay, that's the Colossians passage. The word provoke here um, in Colossians is a little bit different. It, it kind of speaks towards, um, we talked about this one being uh, intent provoking intentionally to anger. This one's more like the, uh, the idea of like, oh, well, I'm teasing. The words that I say are just to, to you know, get a, little, a rise, just get something out of you that I want, like a bully would. We talk about that all the time, you know, bullies look for an arise. So that's the Colossians in that way kind of tweaks it a little bit um, different. And then what, what happens when you provoke your children lest they become discouraged? Man, that terrifies me. <laughs> James 1.19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everybody should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I love this. And you think about when Jesus came and flipped the tables in the temple, right? Did he just like bust open the doors immediately and just start flipping? No, what did he do? He sat down and created a whip. 
And if you know anything about whip, like making first century whips, like that in that way, it's about a three hour process. And that's like, if you're good at it, Jesus didn't just walk in and start busting things down. He said, I'm going to take my time. We're going to pray about this. We're going to, we're, we're going to come back. We're going to get the butt whooping. You know, it's going to happen. But he was slow to anger. Why? Because the human anger, the lashing out, the emotional anger that we, we tend to have doesn't produce godly righteousness. I think it kind of created a curiosity in the people that were watching. <laughs> yeah, what, what is he doing? Yeah, like what, what is happening? Yeah, yeah. So um, the last half of this, um, slaves, verse 5, slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good render service as the Lord, as not to men, knowing that whatever good things each other's each one does that he will receive back from the Lord, whether free or slave. And masters do the same thing to them and give up threatening, knowing that both the master and yours, knowing both their masters and yours is in the heavens, and that there is no partiality within him. Mm. It's good stuff. Um, David Guzik says that um, it should be said of every Christian that he is a hard worker and gives his employee a full day's work for his pay. To do anything less is to steal from your employer. And, and Ted and I were kind of talking about it beforehand that, that we as Christians should always look for the opportunity to work harder, to, to do good by our bosses, to do good by our co-workers. Why? Because that's what Christ asked us to do. Um, slaves to their masters. Um, we don't do things out of selfish ambition. We don't do this as um, not by way of eye service, as men pleasers. We do this, we work hard because of Christ. Because Christ worked hard. Because he loves us and he wants us to do good by others. It can be so easy to get in this rat race that, that we have, the American dream style of things. Oh, I need, I need to keep climbing the ladder. I'm, not, I'm, being, I'm being done wrong in this place, in that place, in this place, in that place. When, when Christ says, what does it say in, um, it's in Philippians, I believe. It says, do all things without mumbling, without... I don't remember the exact, but anyways, without complaint or without grumbling. Grumbling is the word I was looking for. Um, we're not to be those who just cause problems and gossip and issues in the workplace. We're to be those who take, take our jobs by the horns and, and, and steer it and make it happen. I'm not saying that there aren't injustices in the workplace. There are plenty of injustices in the workplace, but we're not called to be people who sit and just dwell on those injustices. Um, when we put in work for Christ and not for man, we get blessed, not by man, but by God. Really, you get blessed by the things that you do things for or cursed by the things you do things for. So if you want man's blessing, go ahead, climb the ladder. Enjoy money and, and whatever riches come from man's, man's ladder. I want to follow Christ. And when you die and they, it doesn't come with you in the grave, you know, sorry. <laughs> You chose that I will put my life, my trust, my hope, and my work in heavenly riches, which for eternity will bless me. It's awesome. We have a goal. I, a lot of people like to say, oh, you know, it's, it's just to get to heaven. I'm like, oh, man, no. There's more to that. There are blessings that come from the work that we do down here when we get to heaven. And I, I work for those things because those are heavenly. Those are eternal. Those are from God Almighty who can give me far more than I can even expect. I work for those things. There is a goal in mind. So the whole point is that our work is our testimony in our workplace. Um, our testimony of Christ is our ultimate boss. Um, that every second that we have, we give our best because Christ has given us what we have, our jobs, our money, our families. We don't complain because the opportunity that we've been given was a gift from God. Um, and to work is a blessing. I think of in Mexico while we were down there, um, the kids knew. We didn't even speak their language, but they knew our act of service was from Christ. They knew that we were sacrificing for them. We didn't have to bring them money, and we weren't getting anything in return, not physically. They weren't paying us to be here. We made all the food, so, like, you know, we were working for the stuff that we were eating, but they knew. Oh, they knew. You could tell on their faces, and when they talked to you, even though they didn't understand that you don't get anything that they're saying, they'd still come and talk to you because they're like, man, you love us. 
you care for us in Christ. The love of Christ radiates from you when you do those kinds of things. And then that last verse, and masters do the same to them. Give up on threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality in him. Christians should also be the best employers and best leaders. Why? Because they lead with impartiality. They have a strong worth ethic. And like we talked about with husbands, they lead from a servant leader's perspective, not from a, I get things out of this. They do it because they want a better life for those who are in, uh, who are under them. And I love that part. Give up on threatening. Oh man, I hear that all the time. I heard it when I was working corporate, corporate America jobs was, um, you know, if you don't get this job done, I'm going to fire you. Oh, great. <laughs> I'm so excited to work now. <laughs> you know, there's a time and place for like those who slack off and need to be fired, but you can't bring that one up every single time somebody's doing something. Especially those who are just starting Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what I want you guys to get in this. If you're a mother and or a wife, do it for Christ. If you're a husband, do it for Christ. If you're a parent, a parent parent apparently, because I put two parents up there. If you're a parent, do it for Christ. If you're a slave or an employee, do it for Christ. Be the best one for Christ. And if you're a boss, be the best boss for Christ. Why? Because our riches are stored up in heaven. It's a lot of sacrificing, a lot of trouble that we'll go through for it. You'll catch a lot of flack in this world for doing it. Why would you take a lesser paying job to see your family? Well, you answered the question. <laughs> Thanks for it. You know, why would you, why would you do this? You had this opportunity. Well, I realized that if I did this, I'd take away from my time with the Lord. My stepfather, Merv, uh, used to own a do or a quadplex, two duplexes. I don't know if they're called quadplexes. And it made him good money. I mean, it was more than enough for him to live off of and support a ministry down in Mexico. But what he realized after doing it for a couple of years was every single time he went on a mission trip, he had to leave back because a water, a pipe broke, a heater, a, 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 a AC went out, a leak came up. He's like, man, I have to quit all of my ministries early because I have to get back and, and deal with all this. So while it looks like a blessing because the finances are coming in, it was a curse because all the ministry was being destroyed. It's my encouragement to you guys. And whatever you guys do, do it the best and do it the best for Christ. Not because you'll get man's affirmation, not because you'll get money, which is nice. It looks nice now. But again, like Ted said, doesn't, doesn't follow us. It'll, it'll, and you can spend money really, really quick. <laughs> so do it for the glory of Christ. Amen.